Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Mm -hmm. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. This is expositional Bible study, which is quite rare in Christian culture today. Going through the Bible chapter by chapter in this broadcast, we've already completed the 1160 chapters of the Bible in six years. Mm -hmm. We've started over in this rotation. We've already done Genesis and the four Gospels, and now we're coming back. We've completed Exodus and now Leviticus. Leviticus is one of those books I've heard people say recently, Oh, Leviticus, I just have <laughs> such a hard time getting through it. But when you understand what's behind Leviticus, See, in Exodus, God brought the people out and cut covenant with them at Sinai. Mm -hmm. And then because they were willing to come into covenant with him, he then instructs Moses, okay, you're in covenant with me. I need you to build a tabernacle. I'm coming off this mountain and I'm going to dwell in your midst. And so Moses gets these instructions, how to build the tent of the tabernacle, a movable place of worship. And uh, then uh, after he gets the instructions, uh, God calls Bezalel and his helper Aholiab, along with other skilled artisans among the people, to build the tabernacle from the wealth of Egypt that was given to them when they crossed the Red Sea. And how much wealth was it? Well, by some approximations, well over $100 million that they came out with. Amazing. That's the transfer of the wealth. Amen. Remember, that's the shadow. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 tells us mm -hmm. we walk in the substance. Right. If the shadow was ostentatious wealth, the transfer of the wealth, what do you think God's going to do in the new covenant? Yes. And so we're looking to walk. He said, I would that you prosper and be in health. And prospering means comes down to dollars and cents, God taking care of. People that don't preach that, they're preaching blasphemy. Mm -hmm. God is a God of abundance. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. After they built the tabernacle, and uh, Moses then installed Aaron and his sons, gave instructions to the rest of the Levites what to do when they had to move that tabernacle. And now in Leviticus, he's saying, now that you have this tabernacle, now that the priests are installed, now that you know how to move this when the cloud moves, let me show you what I want to happen in this tabernacle. And Leviticus is all about these different mm -hmm. sacrifices. We've talked about a consecration offering. It's interesting that the sin offering did not come first. Just like when Moses actually installed the articles of the tabernacle, you'd think the brazen altar to deal with sin, we got to deal with sin first. It was the very last thing they put in. The first thing they put in was the Ark of the Covenant. It speaks of God's heart toward us. And so here today in Leviticus 3, we're studying about friendship with God in the peace offering. If these studies have been a blessing to you, we, we want to hear from you. Email us at Russell Walden, that's R-U-S-S-A-L-L, R-U-S-S-E-L-L-W-A-L-D-E-N at Gmail, R-U-S-S-E-L-L. W-A-L-D-E-N at Gmail. We want to know you're out there and you're being blessed by the broadcast. But we're learning about a form of sacrifice today called the peace offering. In the peace offering, we are acknowledging that Jesus is our peace. The kingdom is righteousness, joy, and peace. Amen. It expresses covenantal friendship with God, such as Abraham had of old. The peace offering was different. It called for special handling of the blood, the fat, and the kidneys of the sacrificial animal. These things were considered the choicest parts mm -hmm. of the animal, and they reflected the offerer giving God his best and God giving you his best. And it's a foreshadowing of what God has given us in Christ and how we respond. It's interesting when you see, particularly in the New Testament, about the peace of God, that word peace, and I have an aunt, uh, Aunt Irene, she's gone to heaven now, but her name derives from the Greek word used in the Bible for peace, Irene, hmm. and it means the peace of one whose warfare has been done away with. 
Wow, let's have that. So how would you like your warfare to be done away with? Amen. Man, we're warring on the job. We're warring uh, with our kids. Some of you are warring with your spouse. How would you like that warfare to be done away with? Well, that's it's not just something that God does for you. It's something that he is to you. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in this study, we're going to look into if he is our peace, this offering speaks and informs us about just at what depth he is that to us. Amen. It's a short chapter. Leviticus 3. Kitty, if you would read the entire chapter. It'll be easy. Thank you. <laughs> Leviticus 3 1. And if his oblation, it's like we're starting in the middle of this, a thought here. Yeah, it starts in the mid sentence. <laughs> And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon, uh, upon the altar round about. Notice that when Paul talks about peace in Ephesians 1 and 2, he makes a statement, he said, Male or female, it's all right. the same. Right. And in this, it says male or female, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. Religion makes a distinction. But even in the shadow of which Christ is the substance, mm -hmm. uh, bring that offering, and we are to be living, a living sacrifice, sacrifice. according to Romans 12. Doesn't matter if it's male or female, God's going to receive it. Amen. Verse 3, And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the <clears throat> excuse me, all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by flanks, and the caul up above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering for a sacrifice I'm sorry, and if his offering for a sacrifice of peace, offering to the Lord be of a flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. And he offer a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat thereof and the whole rump, it shall, it shall he take off hard by the backbone, and the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. And the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the cull above the liver with the kidneys, he shall take away. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is a food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. And if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of it and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. And he shall offer thereof his offering, even an evening, sorry, evening offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards. And the two kidneys and the fat that's upon them which is by the flanks, and the cull above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is a food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generation throughout your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. It's interesting. The offering hmm. was an offering of the herd. And the herds were made up of clean animals. And so every one of those animals, to be clean animals, mm -hmm. they had to split the hoof and chew the cud. Chew the cud. What does that mean? <laughs> we walk with the hoof. And to split the hoof, it talks about rightly dividing the Word of God. And that right division of the Word of God being reflected in your walk. Mm -hmm. And to chew the cud. Now that's talking about rumination. How that a cow will eat grass and they swallow it bring it back up, and they chew it some more, <laughs> and they swallow it, and they it's talking about rumination, with room, to ruminate, to meditate. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're, we're not just 
dashing off a couple of verses out of our scripture bread box, although I have one of those. <laughs> it's being able to ingest the word. As living sacrifices, we come and offer ourselves to God in the sacrifice. We, we have to be a clean animal. We have to rightly divide in our walk with God. And we have to be one that meditates like God told Joshua day and night mm -hmm. in the Word. If we're not doing that, that's an unclean animal. Why? Because it's fearful. You see, people, if you're not meditating on the Word, mm -hmm. you're meditating on Fox News or MSNBC, mm -hmm. if you're not splitting the hoof, if you're not rightly dividing in your walk, but you're listening to all these other influences, that's fear. And the fear of the Lord is clean. Every other fear is unclean. Amen to that. So you have to be a clean sacrifice by rightly dividing and being a person, a man or woman of meditation in God's word. So, here in Leviticus 3, we find instructions concerning the peace offering. Thus far in Leviticus, we've learned about two kinds of consecration offerings, animal sacrifice and grain offerings for those that couldn't afford an animal. Now, we turn our attention to a different oblation called the peace offering. Now, each of these offerings speaks to us. When you read this stuff, say, what does this tell me about who Jesus is to me? About God's process by which he works in our lives. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, we haven't gotten to the trespass offering yet. Uh, you would think that the trespass offering would be first, as it was in the mention of the sacred furniture when it was installed. The Ark of the Covenant, speaking of God's mercy, was mentioned first. That's the first thing God told Moses to get in that tabernacle once it was built. And then the brazen altar came last. So this shows us that repentance for sin from a scriptural standpoint, it's not marginalizing it. It's establishing it that it is not an object in itself. What does God want? God wants repentance. No, Repentance is a means to an end. God wants relationship. Amen. And repentance is the means by which we enter into that relationship. Amen. The peace offering is considered a requital offering, meaning it's something returned in response to a service rendered. If uh, somebody does something for you, for pay, you are requiting them when you write that check. Uh, you rent your house or you have a mortgage on your house, you're requiting that mortgage holder or that landlord. Uh, when you pay uh, that payment. Uh, it's a symbolic way. The offering is, the peace offering is a symbolic way of requiting God for what he has done on behalf of the worshiper. The, the full definition of that word in Hebrew, that word peace, is shalom. It's where we get the word shalom. Uh, and, it, and it literally means peace offering, requital, sacrifice, and listen, sacrifice in lieu or in light of alliance or friendship. Words because remember when uh, uh, God cut covenant with Abraham, they laid out a sacrifice. When Abraham and Isaac would have covenant with like Abimelech, King Abimelech, or and then later on Isaac with Abimelech's son, who was also Abimelech, uh, they, they had a sacrificial animal. Now they were not worshiping each other. They were entering into an alliance or friendship of voluntary service. Uh, the Israelite, when he brought his peace offering to God, he did so in recognition. He was looking all the way back to Genesis that when Abraham was established as the friend of God, not just because God liked him. That word friend means something else. The word friend, when it say that person is my friend, that would be an instant picture in the eyes of an ancient Israelite of a covenantal ceremony that involved a sacrificial animal. Uh, and it's about seeking friendship. It's asking God or acknowledging we are in the same covenant with God that Abraham was. And that's what an Israelite was expressing in the peace offering. Mm -hmm. The word friend, we got to get this. It doesn't mean, it's not how we use it today. Are you my friend? <laughs> uh, we are not asking God uh, from the biblical perspective, to say God is your friend, we're not asking God to be our buddy. Mm. How many know God is not our buddy? Oh, no. The word friend comes from the Arabic word offendi. If you ever observed any Arabic uh, uh, dialogue, you'll see that, the word offendi. And offendi means blood covenant partner. 
it points back to say God, we're in friendship with God in the peace offering. It points back to Genesis 15 when God came down in a column of light and smoke and passed between the pieces of a sacrificial animal and ratified actually a unidirectional covenant with Abraham. And according to Paul, Jesus himself, which includes us. In offering the peace offering, the worshiper would lay his hand on the head of the sacrifice and which says, I'm recognizing this and I'm identifying with this. So we are recognizing God's gift of himself and our rendering up of ourselves in like manner. The head speaks of lordship. It's an act of submission. And, and in laying your hand on the head of that sacrifice, you're saying, I am not merely giving of myself. I am giving my very self in entirety to God in a figure through the offering. Now, in choosing an animal for this sacrifice, not just any old barnyard animal would do. It wouldn't be acceptable. The offering was to be, according, you see this in verses 6 through 11, it was to be a perfect specimen. <laughs> My daddy would be sitting in a parking lot and mama would be in the grocery store and some old dude would come out and he's just real slovenly old stained t-shirt and doesn't look like he's had a bath in three months and, and uh, just just really a mess and he'd walk by and my dad would just real quiet he'd say ain't he a specimen <laughs> it had to be a perfect specimen uh, it wasn't acceptable to God to give him the leftovers or the lame or the diseased, although in times of spiritual decline, this is exactly what the Israelites did. King David understood when he purchased the land whereupon the temple would be built that he had to give God his best. The man who owned the ground was just going to give it to him. <laughs> king David, hey, you're king. The land is yours. But in 2 Samuel 24, 24, let's see how David responded. The king said unto Aruna, the guy who owned the land, No, but I will buy it of you at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God that of that which cost me nothing. Mm -hmm. David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for the initial sacrifice at great price. What does that tell us? In coming to Christ, we must make a full surrender. Contaminated, half-hearted offerings of ourselves to God, that provokes his silence and his withdrawal from our lives. When you can't find God and his presence seems far away, you don't need first and foremost somebody to pat you on the hand and say, it'll be okay. No, you need to examine yourself. Examine the level, the quality of your yieldedness and your fidelity to his spirit. In the days of Malachi, the, the priesthood and the people, now listen, in the days of Malachi, they were teaching these same sacrifices. But the problem was the priests and the people in Malachi's day were using the altar of God as a veritable garbage disposal. In Malachi 1, 7 and 8, God speaks against this. And he tells them through Malachi, he says, You offer polluted bread upon my altar. You say... Wherein have we polluted you? And that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible, for you are offering the blind, the sacrifice. Uh, is it not evil? You offer the lame and the sick. Is it not evil? Offer that now to your governor. Pay taxes the way you render up your life unto God and see if I, the IRS will come looking for you. <laughs> uh, we, we need to get that. Just picture that. We've taught enough on this tabernacle. Can you imagine the brazen altar being replaced just by a big old garbage disposal. You're on your way. You must appear before the Lord three times in a year. And on the way to Jerusalem, you see some roadkill. Looks like it's been out there a few weeks. Well, let's just get that, toss it in the trunk, and we'll offer that up to our God. That's the kind of stuff they were doing. Malachi goes on, uh, speaking by the Spirit of God, and he was saying, I just wish somebody who loves and honors me would simply put the light out in the temple and shut the doors. We should never forget that. I'll never forget the second church I pastored. Prayed for two years straight for God to send revival. And we did see God do some things. We went from 13 people up to 350. But in the midst of that, uh, in the midst of two years of committed congregational prayer, praying till 2, 3 in the morning, uh, 
Uh, I, I didn't build that church. I took it over from somebody else. And the Lord whispered to me. He said, I didn't bring you here to build this church. And he gave me that verse in Malachi. Right. He said, I brought you here to put the light out and shut the doors. And then over a course of time, I didn't like that too much. But then over the course of time, he showed me why. No point getting into that now. But God won't accept our leftovers. One of the things is that church building was built in seconds. That church building was built with surplus secondary um, materials that weren't fit to be sold across the counter in the lumber yard. So they were just given, well, we'll just give this to the church. They weren't giving God the best. God said, that's it. It's abomination. It's an insult. Without blemish. You think about that. Listen, when we give ourselves to God, we've got to give him our best. When you accept Christ, you are not merely adding a spiritual dimension to your life that you will then live in self-determination. God's a jealous God. God wants all or nothing. One writer made the following statement about God's white-hot jealousy. He said, God's jealousy does not arise from fear or weakness, but from holy indignation and having his honor and his mercy scorned by faithless pride. You know, one of the things, we have the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher in Ephesians 4.11. I want you to notice that one of the fivefold ministries is not influencer, social media influencer. <laughs> you see a lot of worship, very prominent worship leaders in the body of Christ in the last couple of years that have stood up and say, I no longer believe in God. Uh, I don't accept a God that's so immature that he's jealous and that he's this and that he's that. They have no clue. See, in other words, their idea of a full surrender, that's not what they got into this for. And here they are, their household names in the worship culture of the church. The churches that employ them consider themselves to be on the cutting edge of everything God is doing. And they don't even have the faintest idea of the quality of commitment that God expects. A jealous God. When the offering was made, part of it was burned completely and a portion was divided to the priests. And uh, even at times back to the worshiper who would partake of it as well under the priest's supervision. However, what the part that was totally burned was the fat, the kidneys, the blood was totally poured out. That uh, They were always the part offered to God only. Now in our culture, how would you like to have some kidney pie or some blood pudding? Mm -hmm. Excuse you. me, our friends in England. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't know too many of them that eat blood pudding. <laughs> and uh, and the kidneys, the blood, the kidneys, and the fat. Well, look, let's just have a big old piece of fat. Well, that's just not something we prize <laughs> in our culture. But they were considered the choicest pieces, portions, in ancient times. Mm -hmm. The blood was revered, and the people were forbidden from taking any part of it. It's interesting that when they were deciding the Gentile question, they said, look, they were saying, those Gentiles have to keep all the law. And Peter said, no. And they, they carried on for days in Acts 15, having a big old church fight over whether to let the Gentiles into the church. And finally they agreed, yes, and here was their judgment. But they have to abstain from strangled meat, animals that have been killed by strangling, from blood, and from fornication. Look, you come to church, but would you please quit fornicating? Okay, I'll try. Uh, and don't partake of blood. What's the thing about blood? Leviticus 17.10 says, the life is in the blood. So you Cajun folks, you need to give up that blood boudin. Are you listening to me? I'll get emails on that one. <laughs> when you give blood to God, you're giving him your life. When he gives you his blood, he's giving you his life. The life of God is in you by the shedding of the blood of Christ. The kidneys in ancient times were looked upon as the the center or the seat of your emotions or passions. When you offered up kidneys to God in sacrifice, you were giving him your deepest desires and emotions. And that's very interesting that in religious culture, uh, we reject displays of emotion. We want to be urbane. We want to be soft-spoken. We want to be sophisticated and cool. Not all of us. <laughs> but you know those same people? <clears throat> Who, who sit stoically in a religious service, stone-faced and silent, they will scream themselves hoarse at a sporting event. 
even more astonishing is that they see same people see absolutely no contradiction in that disparity. It's, it, see, Paul coined the term carnal and spiritual. And the word carnal comes from the word carne, the Greek word carne, like chili con con. Mm -hmm. And it means it's got meat in it. It means carnal means to be animated by the flesh. Spiritual means to be animated by the spirit. Uh, so to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace, Paul said. Uh, what's an idea of being carnally minded? I'm old enough to remember the cigarette commercials. I'd walk a mile for a camel cigarette. Or uh, Terryton cigarettes. I'd rather fight than switch to another brand. Mm -hmm. So what does that, that tell you? It's, that's a perfect example of being animated by the flesh. Those people that would never lift their hands in worship. You put them on the prices right. And they win something behind the curtain where Carol Merrill is now standing. They are beside themselves. And so Just saying, huh? <laughs> we need to think about these things. When we withhold our passion from God, you are violating the foreshadowing in this chapter mm -hmm. of rendering up to God this very best. When you are taking your emotions and you can get emotional about other things, but not about God, you're eating the portion of the sacrifice that is forbidden, that's for God only. And what he's really saying is, I want to be the only thing you get excited about. Amen. Now, fat, what does fat represent? Fat speaks of surplus. In modern times, we're a people surrounded by surplus. In America alone, 126 billion pounds of food end up in the landfill every year. And you know what that is? Even more sobering. That's 50% of the total food consumption in the United States. Yes. Right at half of our national food consumption winds up, food that is produced winds up in the garbage. We throw away enough food <laughs> to feed starving nations many times over. Obesity, it's a growing epidemic. It's become a crisis that's crippling our health institutions. And it's predicted to crush our economies with the weight of our own ex excess at the expense as this obese generation gets older in their, of their health care costs. In both the Old and the New Testament, there is a repeated and strong emphasis on giving your surplus to the poor in service to God. I read an interview with a, a guy who just came out of North Korea and he spent a year in the U.S. now. And they were interviewing and says, what, what have you found different? You know, for one thing, he said, how friendly Americans are. He said, in North Korea, they were taught that Americans were mean, spirited. And he said, everywhere I go, the people are telling me, hi, hi, how you doing? The other, the other thing is, he said, uh, another thing that just astonished me about America is, is you can gain weight in America. Because he'd grown up in a culture where it was impossible to gain weight. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the calories available to them. Sure. So why is the fat represented as being expressly for God? You'll note that it says that the, it, it was explicitly the fat that covered the internal organs. That's what God said, that the fat that covered the internal organs was the fat that he wanted. Mm -hmm. To ancient people, the organs represented the personality and the character. That's who you are mm -hmm. in their thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, one commenter put it this way. He said when God wanted the fat surrounding the entrails, he was telling the Hebrews that the heart, feeling, and character of man belong to him. You, you belong to me, he says. So what about you? Are you restricting your inmost being as for God only and only for God? Are there divided loyalties regarding God's word where you obey the scripture in one area but conveniently ignore it in another? Can you be moved emotionally over things other than God? If a uh, publisher's clearinghouse knocked on your door and you've won multiplied millions, well, you'd get emotional about that. But what about the fact that that part of your being, God says, that's mine and mine alone. It's like, well, I don't understand that. Well, think about marriage. Marriage is exclusivity. And we, we pray, oh, God, I'm going to try and be faithful to you today. Mm -hmm. Well, what if I told my wife that? Okay, honey, I, I, I've got to go to work. And Kitty, I want you to know I'm going to try and be faithful to you today. And I'd say I know better. <laughs> you think about that. 
So God is a God who demands all or nothing. Let your commitment to him be entire today. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the uh, picture of this sacrifice, this peace sacrifice. It shows us that you want all or nothing. Help us, Lord, to retrain ourselves and to take that core of our being that, that engages our emotions at a most visceral level yes. and reserve that only unto you, Father. In Jesus', Jesus. name, amen.